The following presentation was recorded at the Southeast Linux Fest in Charlotte, North Carolina. It is licensed under a Creative Commons license. For more information about the Southeast Linux Fest, please visit www.southeastlinuxfest.org. The Southeast Linux Fest would like to thank the following diamond sponsors for helping make these videos possible. In these kind of talks with me, basically. Why do you want to listen to me? Who I am? Uh, my name is David Bochamp. I work for a company called Xtuple. We produce an enterprise resource planning product called Xtuple ERP. This is a completely open source stack built on Qt. Uh, the back end is PostgreSQL, so hence we wanted to give this talk today on PostgreSQL. Uh, and everything, even our commercial sides of this, everything is open source. So if you give us some money, all the commercial stuff, you'll get every piece of source code, whether you want it or not. It's kind of a nice thing. A little bit overwhelming sometimes. Uh, on the hobbyist side, I help contribute to Arch Linux ARM, primarily keeping the packages updated. Every single time mainline Arch updates the package, we have to as well, most of the stuff, and that's kind of where I come in. I am a developer within the company. One other title I hold is Implementation Engineer. This primarily means getting people to use our software properly, implementing it, right? But coming along with that helps uh, if you actually know the back end. So primarily what I do is PostgreSQL administration uh, and architecture. And I like to break things a lot. But if you don't break things, then you never get to figure out how to fix them. So it's the fun side of things. Uh, I have given this talk to two people prior to coming down here. The first time I gave it, it was 30 minutes. The second time I gave it, it was an hour and a half. So let's see if we can kind of condense it and meet somewhere in the middle. But if you guys have questions about any of this stuff, I'm not the kind of person who wants to wait to the end. Just go ahead and raise your hand. Let's get a question, get the answer while we're talk talking about the subject. So where to begin? What is PostgreSQL? I'm assuming a lot of people in this room actually have an idea, but we'll go over some of this. What are foreign data wrappers? Why you may care about the combination of PostgreSQL and foreign data wrappers? And then going ahead and taking a dive in to the subject at hand, to the different kinds of foreign data wrappers there are. Now, PostgreSQL itself, it's a database system. It's primarily known for being an open source object relational database system. One of the nicest parts about PostgreSQL is it's not controlled by a single corporation. It was started by Great Bridge. Since that time, however, it has been handed down to a committee, and it's controlled by a committee, not a single corporation. Thank you for joining. It's multi-platform. It runs on most Unix-compatible operating systems. And when I say most, I have yet to find one that I wasn't able to build it for. Uh, we primarily run it on Linux, but we do also have people who insist on using Mac Mini servers, so it runs on the Mac Mini or any other operating system you tend to have fun with. Foreign data wrappers themselves. It's a fun name for an implementation of SQL Med. SQL Med is a SQL standard. It's management of external data. And it provides a way to let end users and end developers connect to external or arbitrary data sources. Now, this sounds like a whole lot of gobbledygook. But uh, we basically, if you're working in a database, you don't have to leave that database connection to access external data. Uh, this becomes really powerful in the context of something like my software company, which provides enterprise resource planning, the whole idea of putting everything in one view, this enables connectivity to all of the stuff that people used to have. This allows us to replace software more than ever before, put it that way. Um, and, and this is my little end. They're the harbinger of doom for middleware. I don't know how many of you have had uh, exposure to things like BizTalk or some of the other pieces of software that intend to connect one software to another. Without having to leave Postgres now, we can stay inside the ecosphere and connect to these sources without needing something like this talk to do the ETO or ETL for us. Why you should care? I don't know what your guys' positions are within the company or what your roles are within your industry or your hobby, but the idea here is we have a back end. It's a database server. We have another back end or a front end such as a web service or we have a file on disk or we have a sales and marketing department who decides they want to dump everything into a Dropbox folder and hope people can find it this way. We can take these places and actually test out and do an integration directly in the database server, database server sorry, to actually pull this data in and retrieve it. And I'm not discussing things like retrieving file names. Some of these will actually allow us to grab the byte contents of these files from disk. So if you think of some of these engineering repositories that have existed in these companies for I don't know how many decades, now you don't actually have to have someone sit there and write all the metadata for it. We can just pull it off the file, pull it off of the file system. The primary point of these and the primary usage of foreign data wrappers for me has been aggregating data. 
I don't know how many different places your enterprise may collect things, such as time clock information, which is always separate, quality control information, which is always something else. Uh, they have some fancy sort of aggregator where they write all these charts and graphs that they put everything into. And all of these are usually a silo in an individual department. When it comes time for people who are DBAs to pull all this information together, it's usually your responsibility to make sure it all lines up, or to keep some offline copy, or to keep a cached copy, or to some way to let the higher-ups analyze and aggregate over this. And using something like a foreign data wrapper, we can basically give them one database connection into Postgres, build the logic all around this connection, and not have to worry about all these other silos. They still may exist, because that's where the end users are putting in data, but the person who's looking at it doesn't need to care anymore. This takes a lot of load off of IT departments. And of course, just like my Harbinger comment on the last one, we get to replace costly proprietary solutions. And this is the thing that almost everybody I've shown these to really cares about the most. Their pension fees, they're using something like Jitterbit where it costs them 15 grand a year to write a script to push data from one column to another, versus what I'm about to show you is free. And it's free as in beer. Great. I'm going to say it's great like a dozen times in this because it's something when I first discovered foreign data wrappers, one of my primary goals at the company, or tasks, I should say, is to connect these systems. And when I found this, I stayed awake for about three days fiddling with it because it was just, oh, I'm, I'm happy and good. All right, let's go ahead and dive in. Now, this is where things start to get fun because we'll go over some examples and some real world, real world cases where I've used this to actually enhance our software. There are a couple different types of foreign data wrappers. This means a few different things, but when I primarily say this, I'm talking about what language they're written in. Basically, every foreign data wrapper starts as a C module, some sort of extension for Postgres, and they're almost always written in C. I think there may be some C++ bindings for them, but I don't think they're actually supported officially, but they're almost always C-based. That being said, there is a native extension called Multicorn, which itself is a C extension. However, it provides a host for you to run Python code as a foreign data wrapper. Now, the actual C native foreign data wrappers, of course, have the advantage of being fast. They have all that fun C advantage. However, for rapid prototyping and for whipping out something that you want to show someone really quickly, you can't beat the multicorn side of this. Now, I have no idea where the name comes from. I'll be perfectly honest. I've read their site 20 times. I have no idea where it comes from. Um, but it, nobody else has used this. It's actually quite a unique name. Now, some examples of foreign data wrappers. There are, of course, as I said, native versus multicorn. The big three that I primarily work with, the Postgres to Postgres foreign data wrapper. Now, there used to be uh, an extension called DBLink, which basically was a Postgres extension written in C that had a series of functions to go along with it to allow you to kind of alias a remote table to a local connection. Every single time you connected to this, you basically had to define what you're expecting as a result set. It was a little messy. Back comes Postgres foreign data wrapper here, uh, and we can make a native, con a native connection either from the same server, a remote server, a hosted AWS RDS instance. doesn't matter what Postgres is, but if you're doing things like developing on one instance and production on another instance, you can link the backend tables together and push changes between the database servers. And by changes, I don't mean schema changes, not DML. I mean... The actual, or sorry, not DDS, I mean actual DNO. Next, of course, MySQL. I mean, I'm sure you guys are familiar with MySQL and Oracle. These are native form data wrappers to connect to these services. Um, more often than not, basically what they involve is building the client library for that. So if you want to use MySQL form data wrapper, you need to have the client library locally, of course, for this. And then you build the FEW and install it just like every other Postgres extension. Now, one of the benefits, of course, using the Postgres foreign data wrappers, it's included in their contrib package. So basically every operating system and every distro that provides binary packages will provide a binary version of the Postgres FDW. The other ones you end up building from source yourself, which means that during a uh, Postgres upgrade, you need to pay attention to also upgrading your custom extensions. Adds a little bit of complexity, but it's still possible. Sorry, I uh, skipped back here. As far as the multicorn side goes, these get to the, a little bit more elaborate and a little bit more esoteric. Um, we, of course, have things like RSS, the file system. Postgres itself has native handling of CSVs, but this is typically done in copy statements or kind of one-time access versus if you have some sort of quality system which insists on outputting rows to a CSV on disk and you want to continually access that CSV, there is, of course, a CSV uh, 
core data wrapper for this. And there's actually probably five or six of them. Some of them that expect Swift, some actually expect delimited text, some that are encoded properly. There's a dozen. Now I kept, um, inside the presentation, I kept uh, kind of a web page up so we can go through some of these if you want to see some of the individual ones. But of course there's, there's no SQL database wrappers, there's stuff for files, stuff for JSON, some of the gist data. Um, you can kind of go overboard with the things you're connecting to, but again, a lot of these, actually that's not true, some of those are native. But when you get into the, the multi-corn side of this, anything Python, I don't know if you guys are, how familiar you guys are with Python, but anything Python can access, you can return. So I mean, if you have things like uh, the MailChimp interface, you can connect to your lists and your subscribers using Python, using their provided API, their SDK actually, the Python module they provide, just loads in as a foreign data ever. are all open. Right. Um, and then, of course, we do things like IMAP, because the Internet Mail Access Protocol. This can be fun. Um, I don't know how well the handling of attachments has been improved, but you can basically get the entire payload of the message and then do the base 64 decoding yourself if you want to. So some mail servers like Exchange provide built-in ability to do things like archive mail or auto BCC, some others. Some don't do this. Some things like Gmail don't give you any connectivity over a lot of this. But you can access it via IMAP in a database server and do your own archiving. If you're selecting from a remote server, I'm going to pull in the information and either stick it locally so it doesn't worry about getting deleted, or you can leave it if you want. Now, I've used the IMAP one specifically for things like tickets. Every company has support at their domain. This usually goes to a mailbox that somebody monitors. I took it upon myself to use this IMAP extension to actually read this foreign table. When new messages come in, I created a support ticket within our, our incident tracker. So now you don't have that delay between when the person sees it or they don't see it. Uh, and the same thing with LDAP. Um, PostgreSQL itself can authenticate to LDAP, but if you want within your application to provide anything from lightweight directory access protocol, you, there is a foreign data wrapper for this. And it seems, why do I need this in my database? Well, now you can use LDAP to provide authentication to read the directory tree without actually having to talk directly to LDAP. The structure of a foreign data wrapper. Now, there are, of course, the extension. This is the code that PostgreSQL itself loads and that you interact with. As I said before, almost all of the extensions themselves are written in C. What they do from that point on is really up to the extension. Uh, Postgres is very flexible in that regard. Uh, and I think, I think just recently with either 9.6 or version 10, well, either the version that was just released or the next one coming out, They've actually moved to the second generation of the C extensions API that they're mandating. There was an early easier version and now a second semi, not as easy. I'm not explaining this properly, but it's all C, so have fun. Sorry about that. Uh, so from the extension itself, we have the core code. The command to create it is create extension, the extension name. I'm going to go over each of these uh, in detail except for create extension because there's only one other option, and that's basically to provide the name of the extension. So for things that are in, on the database server, such as the contrib packages, the actual installation of those is a SQL command within the database server. The other parts of this are the foreign server. This is what you're connecting to. The foreign user, how are you actually accessing this data, and what the data is within that foreign server that you want to access. Uh, each of these three parts have their own create statements to go along with it. Uh, create foreign server, create foreign user, and of course create foreign table. Now, the foreign user, a little bit of extra information that we'll go through, but we'll start with, of course, the foreign server. Uh, this command, just like all other SQL statements, is a declaration. I want to create the server name, give it a name. Um, what foreign data wrapper am I using? So this could be the name of a multi corn one. It could be Postgres underscore FEW. could be the MySQL one. It's entirely up to you. That You just have to have it installed, of course. And then the options. Now, for this one, uh, it's really straightforward. Where, you know, DB name is this, the host is this, and the port is this. But primarily... These options are the things that are exposed by whatever you're connecting to, such as if you're using the MySQL foreign data wrapper, you're going to have one for the, the host, the password, or yeah, the host, the username, the password, the port, et cetera. But for things like the file data wrapper, this is going to be the path to the file on disk. These are basically your connection options, like any other connection string, except in this one, of course. The user you connect as. Uh, so you have the option when creating a user mapping of either letting anybody who tries to access this data source connect as one user. Uh, in Postgres, 
the primary way, I don't, I don't only call it anonymous, but an authenticated user basically has a role of public. Public is assigned by default to almost every object to allow you to read it. So you can say, if I'm logged in, I'm going to create a user mapping for anybody who's logged in to go in and access this source. Now, this is great for people who have view access to the remote stuff, but what if you want to use this same connection to provide someone to be able to modify that remote data? Because these are not unidirectional. Or, yeah, these are bidirectional connections. You can connect and modify things remotely. So maybe you want to use a user that has such permission. Uh, and in this case, you can override and not say public. We're going to go ahead and say for user. When we connect to this server, we're using this username and password. Uh, this is a little inflexible in the way that you have to declare a username and password to connect to them. But it's no different, really, than any other instance where you have to connect one system to another. You have to authenticate somehow. Um, I don't believe this supports KPI quite yet. So you're going to be defining things like a user mapping. So if you have password policies that force their users to change, don't use a regular user for this. Create some sort of service account to use for your connections between your servers. The foreign table. There's a couple ways to import our foreign table information. Uh, so this is where we define what the remote schema is and how we're going to access it locally. Now, the create foreign table options basically are saying, I want to create a table locally in our public schema called local table. I have three columns. In this case, it happens to be an ID, a pay period ID, and a user. We're going to be using the server we defined previously, and the options in this game, case are going to be the table name that we're connecting to. Now, this is what I call the hard way. We're defining the schema of remote. We're going through every single table. We're making a local mapping to say, this is what it looks like here. This is what it looks like there. Now, they don't exactly have to match. You can take in a subset of columns. You don't have to pull in the whole table if you want. Uh, but as of, I think Postgres 9.3, um, might be 9.2, they added uh, import foreign schema. And this is the bee's knees when it involves this. Because you literally can type the statement, import foreign schema, remote schema. Now, in the PostgreSQL land, a schema is sort of a, a partition, get out of here, within the database server. So you have a database, and within that database, you sort of have a partition where you can keep things like tables and functions and sequences kind of isolated together. So within the Postgres land, you have a database server and then a schema underneath it. In some remote instances, like MySQL, you're going to have a schema, which is the only place that you can store data in MySQL. So when you say that, you're basically pulling in from one place. Now, with Postgres, you can individually select these schemas. Some database servers you can't. But again, this is using verbiage from PostgreSQL itself to kind of describe everything. And in this, in this case, we don't necessarily oh, I always do that. We don't have a direct mapping between the foreign words. So we'll use schema. Now I am there. So we're importing foreign schema schema from server, our server we defined before, into the local schema. So we're taking remote information, and we're creating a one-to-one -one mapping for that information locally. You have the ability to limit this command to only include certain tables, or alternatively, we're going to only include everything and exclude these certain tables. So either limit to or accept. And this is the same command, from remote server into local schema. Now we get to some show and tell. So I uh, have PostgreSQL installed locally. So we'll go escape, and we'll drop down into some fun. So I kind of went into this before we came in. I have fun with high DPI on this screen. And the older version of PGMN3 was built on uh, WX widgets, which does not care for high DPI. <laughs> so a lot of the things that you can see uh, will work beautifully. But if you try and do things like, you can't really see <laughs> the text that's returned. So I'm going to kind of flop back and forth between the two database uh, management tools. They're both called PGAdmin. One is three, the one that's on its way out, written with WX widgets. And of course, another one written on Python uh, and Flask. Uh, which has some fun, but I'm not quite used to it yet, so I fumble a little bit. But here we are. All right, so we'll go ahead and define one using RSS. Now, I'm sure you guys all know what RSS is, a simple syndication. So I went out and just grabbed, uh, if you go to southeastlinuxfest.org and view the source, there's the, of course, alternate style sheet link on the top that you can grab the RSS from. And we can go ahead and create a data source for this. Now, the first instance, of course, is to create the server. Uh, we don't need that. Uh, is to create the server. We need to give it a name. We're saying what foreign data wrapper we're using. 
And with the multi-corn option, you have to provide a sub wrapper option, which is saying what Python module am I actually using inside of multi-corn, basically. Uh, for this particular instance, we don't need a username mapping. There is no authentication to the RSS source. We do, however, need a foreign table mapping. We need some way to say, this is the information that we have locally. Now we're pointing to this schema externally. Now, this is going to pull in, parse, of course, the XML and put things in the right places. Now, we need to basically say this is going to be the name of the column. Uh, PostgreSQL does not expect uppercase for column names or for any identifier. If you do provide an uppercase character within it, you now have to quote that character. So we can see pub date is quoted versus description, title, and length are not. And that is why. Uh, so this actually creates our foreign table. And then from underneath our foreign table, we now have a definition that says we can do things like select statements from it. So if we go back to here, we go into our public schema where I've created most of this, we should have foreign tables, and we have self RSS, which has our definition as defined in the previous screens. Now, once we have this, we can do select statements against it. So if we want to actually run things like select star from star or wherever we're going to get from, we can have this. Now, so by executing a select statement from this foreign table, Python, of course, went out, made its web request, parsed the XML, and returned what it, it retrieved for us as an individual tuple. Now, this is just, of course, the publication date and the title, but this also does have, um, we start to get a little fun link. Sometimes the easy things. So, uh, how much fun you guys want to make with me? There we go. I am failing it. DBA. Uh, all right, so this will actually go out and grab the link and the description for everything, which of course is too much text for what we're displaying here, but if for some reason you wanted to build an RSS reader at a PostgreSQL, you have everything you need. Now, this is just one side of it for the RSS stuff. We can go in, of course, as well, and do something a little bit more useful, as I mentioned earlier. So one of the ones that I use most often, besides the Postgres FTW one, is the file system map. Um, I, as an implementer, go into customer sites constantly and am presented with folders full of files that nobody has an index for. Nobody knows what's in them. Nobody knows anything about them other than here's the last 10 years of stuff that we've collected. Uh, and so we need to somehow iterate over them programmatically. Now, the file can get quite elaborate, and I'm going to go over the definition of this one best of my understanding. Because this can get fun as far as parsing out segments of a file name. If you actually have structured data, such as, uh, you know, music slash artist slash album slash title, track title, etc., you can actually parse out each of those segments of the file name and path into its own column within the result set. Uh, you don't have to get that elaborate. You can just do what I did and just said, file. So it's going to give me one element with the entire path string in it. It's really up to you how deep you want to go into this. Um, so just like our previous definitions, we have the server itself. The server defines what wrapper it's using. And in this case, we're going to be using the file system file, uh, foreign data wrapper. I'm creating my table, which has the, the stock one file, which is what I've created. Uh, and I'll go over this. I don't really have a pointer, but I'll try not to fall off the table at the same time. Uh, so we have, of course, our file, character varying, the content, a byte column, and then the file name. Those are the, the two that come with this foreign data wrapper, the bottom two. Now, if you define on your own different segments down below, things like the pattern within here, each of the things you define can become its own column, and you can select from this. And this is what I was saying. You can start getting kind of elaborate here. If you have structured data, if you don't, using this pattern might not return things that you expect to see. Because if it doesn't match that pattern, you're not going to see it, basically. Uh, from this, you're going to say, of course, where are we retrieving this information? Uh, on Unix systems and I think Windows these days, PostgreSQL runs as the user Postgres, almost always, unless you specify something else. And that user has access to very little on the file system. So if you intend to let PostgreSQL connect to things on the file system, that user needs read access to that. It seems basic, but you got to remember, Postgres is a good user. You're going to have to be explicit of what you give it access to. The last two options within the server definition are the content column and the file name column. And these are things that are provided by this foreign data wrapper. Uh, you can give them an alternate name here if you wanted something other than content and file name. 
However, those are the, the two that I end up using the most. And actually, sometimes I don't even touch the file because it's basically going to be the same as the Pelican column. No, this is, it's accessing it as the Postgres binary, which runs as that user. Um, it's, it's decently easy enough to just say, we're going to allow this user, yeah, read to just this folder or something. Like that. Yeah. Just don't, just don't, you know, make it run as root. Yeah. I mean, Unix will let you, right? That's the Unix philosophy. Have fun shooting yourself in the foot. But I don't recommend it. <laughs> uh, that's it. Uh, so when we, when we do this and we create this definition, we can actually do things like, you know, like start from files. So we'll go in here, and I'm not sure if you can actually see this result set down there, uh, but we'll pop into this one. Uh, and then this is, of course, just the PostgreSQL data directory. There's very little in this directory, but we have the configuration file, the Postmaster options. Uh, within PostgreSQL itself, you can control access to uh, host bus interfaces, like network interfaces, individually. So, of course, we have that configuration. We have the PID that it's running as. Now, this just gave us the file name. Uh, as we saw before, we can actually do things like content. Right? If we want, we want the byte value. We can specify the column content, which looks funny in terminal, but looks a little bit better. Oh yeah, this gets me every time. You can fill the entire query window, but it'll try and run them all if you don't actually select one. So this will retrieve our file name as the, and it will retrieve a byte array column of the actual bytes from the disk. Uh, this looking at it in PG Admin isn't going to do a lot for you, of course, if you not, because these are text files, or it's a little easier to read. But if these were actually bytes, then all you'd be seeing is the encoded string of bytes. Not going to be much good. However, this now gives you direct byte access to all the files on disk. So I don't know if any of you have ever run anything like a SolidWorks EPDM, which is a sort of an engineering workflow management any of this product data management stuff, they all love to write out files to disk. What good is that to anybody who has access to that file system? Well, now we can provide things like the engineering and the support staff direct access to these files, these support drawings, these renderings, these whatever, from within their ERP without them ever having to know what SolidWorks is. Uh, this is more powerful than it seems. It's a directory listing, but this is our database server listing these files and retrieving the bytes for us. We can now get this stuff from anywhere we have a database connection. This, this, to me, is possibly one of the more powerful things that we deal with now. You have access to files. But at the same time, you now have a database server that has access to files, and that should be terrifying as well. So make sure that you keep things nice and clean. All right. That was the other side. All right. So on to a practical example. Uh, I have done, uh, most recently, an integration between a payroll software and our ERP. Now, a lot of people will think of, well, why don't you do ERP yourself? Or why don't you do payroll yourself? It's way too, way too involved. There's way too much regulation. There's way too much taxes stuff changing. Uh, we need a company twice our size to manage just the tax structure changes every year. But we don't. Uh, we do everything else for the company except for payroll. But it's probably one of the first things that people ask us. What's your payroll solution? Well, now I don't have to care what your solution is. Because as long as I can get some sort of connectivity to that, I can go in and pull in things like your payroll information directly into my database server. I don't need to care about your payroll service. Now, everybody can push flat files back and forth. That's probably the thing that people do the most. Uh, and it should terrify you that they, banks and stuff still use FTP primarily for this. Um, this is something that I deal with constantly. How do we get this ACH information over? Here's FTP. Yeah, <laughs> without, without a tunnel. <laughs> Just send it. Yeah. Uh, Regulations on everything else except for this kind of stuff. Um, but one of the prime ones that we connect with is another open source uh, payroll software called Timetrix. Now this is based either on MySQL, or MySQL, sorry, or PostgreSQL, and we deal directly with the PostgreSQL instance. As far as Timetrix cares, it doesn't care what the back end is running on. Uh, as far as us, we prefer Postgres. Easier to work with, right? So um, on our database server, we can have some fun. We'll hop into PG Admin 4. So just like before, I have a, for, a foreign server defined named TT, just short for time tracks, and I have a local schema that I've created also called TT, short for time tracks. Now this statement, import foreign schema public, will connect to my remote server TT, which happens to be a PostgreSQL server. It will iterate over all the instances and the tables and stuff that are in that public schema, and it will go and create a mapping locally in my schema called TT. So 
this executes faster than it should. Really? Um, and now we go back to the easy one that's easy to browse. So as we can see, there are no foreign tables. I click on it, it refreshes, and now there's 123 foreign tables within here. Now, every single one of these is a link now to a table on the remote instance. Uh, any query that you could have run on that side, you can now run locally. One of the things that I did not touch on when I started talking about the foreign tables is that not only do you have write access to this, but you also have trigger access to some of the remote data sources. Not all of them support remote triggers, but the Postgres foreign data wrapper does. So you can create a trigger that will run on your local server when something happens on the remote data source. Uh, so one of the things people like to worry about is, I have these two data sources, how do I move data from one to another? Does someone have to go and click a button, or what do I have to do? Well, if you have a remote trigger, nobody has to do anything because your trigger took care of it. Uh, it does not import triggers automatically. Of course, you have to create those yourself, but they are supported. Now, this pulled in a lot of tables. Now, unless you're familiar with the remote schema that you're dealing with, this is not going to help you understand that remote software better or worse. This is just giving you a connectivity to this. What you do with it is still up to you. But just the fact that we now have a link from here to another database on another server, we don't. We no longer have this talk in the middle. We have this piece of software right here with our tables that will let us pull in whatever we want. And we can start going over how I've used this. Now, uh, we're going to dump in briefly to uh, my company's software, Xtuple because this is pretty much where I've set basically everything up. Underneath our accounting menu, I drop in a new menu called payroll, where we can go in and, of course, set up payroll, which I already did. Uh, this is just a walkthrough of creating the foreign server. Uh, none of our end users know what PG Admin is. I wouldn't say none, but most of our end users don't know what PG Admin is, and it's poor to tell them that they have to go in there to set things up. So we, of course, will create a, a payroll import wizard to have them go through and set up the, the host and all this fun stuff. And high DPI does not like some of those labels. However, once this is defined, we actually now have access to that payroll data. Um, so from within our ERP, we can go into accounting, we can go into payroll and import payroll. When we query on this screen, this is using Postgres foreign data wrapper to connect to a remote database server. Uh, and I'm actually trusting that the internet will stay up right now because this is hosted at my house. Uh, and these, uh, the only payroll runs that I have from when I first set this up Basically, within time tracks, of course, when you're defining a pay period, you have the time of when the people are getting paid from the beginning and the end of two weeks, maybe one week, maybe a day, who knows. But at the end of this, we have the start date, end date, and a transaction date when your transactions are going to hit your ledger. Um, I don't know how familiar you guys are with the whole accounting side of things, but the only thing that a software cares about, like ours, about payroll, is what happened to your books. It's not really all it cares about. What of my accounts were affected by this? Uh, and for some reason, typing it in becomes too much. So we end up providing a solution to right-click on it. We can go ahead and import that ledger. That went out, did all the query on the remote server, aggregated the data that I wanted, and was done within seconds. Uh, and now we have within our software here an actual ledger that we can go in and say, all right, you know, double entry booking says we have to have two sides that balance. So we no longer have 4,300 bucks in cash. We gave it all to this employee. We paid his FICA. We paid his Medicare uh, on his side of his liabilities. And now within our database software, within our ERP software, we can pull in these live transactions without someone having to go in and key in every count, without having to fat finger in the amounts, and then go back and try and figure out why things don't balance anymore. Uh, so this is a really straightforward and simple. I say simple in that it seems simple from the end user. Like all they had to do, the accountant can go in and import this ledger and be done with it. And now the thing that used to take her four hours every week on Thursday, she did in one click. These are the kinds of things uh, when you're going in from a company from a position like mine is don't ask people what they do. Just watch what they do because they don't know that the thing that's taken them four hours can be done in a couple clicks. So you don't, you don't ask those questions. You just, you just watch. And people like me can come in and say, all right, here we go. We're done. We have our ledger transactions. We can go through and import our pay period and be done with this. Now, once you get someone in the accounting department or someone on that side on your side, now they're going to start wanting all kinds of stuff, and which is great. As a consultant, that's what you want. right? I want more work to come in. And not only that, but I want them to be happy with the stuff that I make for them. In ERP, everybody hears of, of you know the horror implementation that fails, and they spend $6 million trying to implement Oracle. 
we avoid this. We, we try our hardest to, to not, if you're not going to like our software, we don't necessarily think you're going to be a good fit for it. So why are you necessarily pushing for it? But for things like this, you know, a couple hours of work, we can save someone four hours every week. Start to add up for a company. Now, within the software here, um, even though we've connected using a tool other than PG Admin, we of course have database access. We're within uh, an instance that has an open database server. If I can tile that up. So even um, even from within the GUI, we have access to all of this. I mean, it's it's just a simple database connection inside a database connection that's now making an HTTP request on your behalf. This is the the basis of a foreign data wrapper. Our thing is just like that. Now, I, I don't know what uses you guys have of database backends or what your primary tasks are to use this kind of thing, but I hope I've given you some idea of the things that you can do with this. Now, I've really scratched the surface. The docs, the documentation from PostgreSQL is, is some of the best for any open source project. The only thing I think is better may be the uh, Arch Wiki, but I might be biased on that one. Um, but you go in there, you're going to get the answers you need. And if not, the, there's a free node channel that'll answer everything else. Um, I didn't prepare to go further into depth into any of the other foreign data wrappers, but we have things like Git. You want to pull in log. You want to go in and see who committed what recently. We can actually read Git from the file system. Um, I don't know if you guys have any examples of stuff that you want to talk about for this. I do not know if there is an Excel. Yeah, let's take a look right here. Oh, it's always Excel. Actually, you know, I, I don't know why I'm not using the ability to just type and see. No, no Excel. However, my answer there, save as. Right? Yeah. So, you, and that's, everybody wants us. You're not wrong. We are in open source, open source software based on Qt. Qt doesn't handle Excel directly, so we either need to use a library or write our own parser. Nobody really wants to do this when all they have to do is save as to a CSV, and then we don't have to worry about some proprietary format. Especially a third-party library. Yes, you're absolutely right. So I would as well. Most of the time, I don't necessarily get to dictate that. But yeah, there's, there, there is. There, there's no active CSV file. There's no. There's no interpreting. There's no VBA. Yeah, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. But there's, um, yeah, Excel's never going to go away. As, as much as, especially someone who loves Postgres so much, I have no idea why people would use Excel for any of this stuff. I mean, I, I do. I say this, but I absolutely do. It's familiarity. They even, we can provide within our company's application detailed financial information This is you know, for decades. We can pretty much go back. We can give you insights into your, your material costs, into pretty much all this stuff. But it doesn't matter if it's in the application or not. What they want is they want a screen where they can right-click on it, they can go ahead and export it, and they can get a dump of everything they see that they can go and bring into Excel and manipulate that way. Uh, and I find this most often in the accounting department, and what they want to do is to be able to take those columns and do funny things with the numbers. It's almost always, and I say funny things, and I don't necessarily mean illegal funny things, I just mean they have some way in their head that they want to aggregate and see this, or some metric or some KPI they want to see. Right, and they want to do this, and they can either have someone like me write some sort of code to allow them to dump in the data and parse it for them, which very well may be an extremely expensive proposition, or they're going to go in and take that data and, you know, ruin it somehow. But the, the, I don't mind people getting stuff out. It's when they want to then take what they changed and put it back. Because a lot of times, people who are coming from, yeah, <laughs> you're laughing. So we provide an open source version of the software, uh, a free open source version of the software called Postbooks. And it, the name is not chosen for no reason. We, oh, one of the things that we convert people from a lot is QuickBooks. And in QuickBooks, you can do pretty much whatever you want to your financial numbers. And that's not, of course, normal. Like when you have a transaction that hits our ledger, you're not allowed to, to touch that. That transaction is there from that point on. You can make another one which corrects the previous one, 
but you can't just go in and edit your ledger. You can't go in and say, oh, I didn't pay that guy a thousand bucks, I only paid him eight hundred. It doesn't work that way. And, right, and that's exactly the thing. Well, guess what? It, it isn't us. You know, we want to be compliant with transactional history. We want to be able to be compliant with any kind of CIA, or not CIA, any kind of um, tax audit or any of this stuff. And we have to provide transactional integrity. So that's, then that's what? We give them a spreadsheet, they do what they want, and they say, these are the numbers they want. What do you want me to do with this? Like, I'm not going to jail for funny numbers, right? Um, but it's not, it's, it's people have asked. And that's all, it's almost always financial. And the other side of this, um, the one thing, and don't, don't get me wrong, we provide numerous abilities to bring in and import data. Now, you, everybody thinks of vendor lock-in, especially if you hear things like Oracle, your data is in their, if you go into SAP 1 and their web stuff, your data is basically there, Salesforce. Your data is in their instance. You're only getting it out unless you're going to be paying them multiple thousands of dollars to get it out. We're the complete opposite. It's odd being an ERP system where not only do we provide direct connectivity and we allow people to go in and do whatever you want to our back end, but we actually provide um, what we call API views but are really just database views in the software that normalize things for you. And I mean, for everything in our database, we of course use primary keys. We of course use foreign keys. We have things which are named properly. So if we have a table called item, then within that item table, the column names are item underscore. So if we have a foreign key in another table, we know by that foreign key name that it's in this table and we can go browse to it, regardless of the foreign key actual link pointing us there. Uh, so we're extremely normalized. However, getting data in and out of our software is really as simple as browsing and viewing these views, because we do all the work for you. PostgreSQL, it's called a view, but it's a little bit of a misnomer because they're writable. And not only are they writable, you can do update statements and insert statements, but they're basically handled by rules. If you do things like, when I delete a row on this view, don't delete, go ahead and call this function with the value in there. This is excellent for cleanup. When people are migrating to our software, importing data, right into here. We don't, they don't need to care about the back end. We do both in, in different instances. Um, so us, ourselves internally, Never touch these. They're funny because sometimes these will get stale. And I don't mean to say like it's funny, but we'll add data to these, but because we almost never use them internally, we'll add a column that won't appear in the view and we'll have to bump it in the next rev, right? But yeah, a lot of the transformation and things are done using triggers. Uh, especially we provide a tool called CSV imp. Uh, it's written for our software, but it's generic in the sense that it will import data into any Postgres database. Any CSV file, you can go ahead and create a mapping and import the data in. Uh, and what we end up doing with this is create a temporary table dump everything in there, and then use a trigger or uh, import tool has the ability when you're done thing, to actually run code that you specify, so you can be called. Sorry, squeaking. Um, but otherwise, yeah, you do exactly that. Now, and you'll see when this one, this is a, something that we do a lot of time. Um, I don't know if we can do sales line here, because when you're doing a lot of things within the application, and this is more unrelated to foreign data wrappers in any way. This is just more Postgres stuff. When you're actually inserting a line, a lot of times when you're doing this, there's a lot of extra functionality that happens. So we, we're not going to encapsulate that in the view. We're going to extract that into a function that we can reuse in a thousand places that this view just happens to call. Um, and so we use these again. Again, data incoming, outgoing. Foreign data wrappers in this sense, you're creating a view into your structure so your end user doesn't have to care what your schema is. They have an item number. They don't need to care that's that's based on an item ID that points to another table for the class of item. They don't need to care about any of that. Uh, and when you do the database this way, doing things like foreign data wrappers to connect that external data becomes a million times easier. And I don't know how many of you have worked with uh, softwares like Microsoft Dynamics, Great Plains, or any of their suites. They have table names that are three digits and three numbers that they incremented sequentially as they went through modules, like INV, 001, 002, 003, that their name of the table does give, gives you no idea what's actually in it. And then they charge you about 2500 bucks a year to get access to the dead doc to tell you what's in it. Now, we're not the holy grail of commenting things, but we do try on the tables to at least say what the table is, what the hell is the table for. But not only that, as I mentioned before, we normalize everything. You know, they're not crazy. We have AP select. Guess what? AP select is the column names. When it has a foreign key somewhere else for the currency table, it's going to AP select cur ID points to cur ID. So, I mean, when you actually think out of a database server, the schema will tell you where you need to go. Um, again, completely unrelated to foreign data wrappers, but while we're on the topic of integrating servers and services together, these are the kind of things when you're structuring these that will help you in the long run. I mean, we can get hit by a bus, and the next guy who comes in goes, where is this key pointing to? Oh, it has the exact name. 
Uh, this is one of the things that we hear feedback from our customers a lot. They just love it. Coming from softwares which are not denormalized <laughs> into ours, which are nice and organized and structured, and we use PostgreSQL schemas, it's uh, refreshing to work with. Um, and I myself came from a customer. Uh, I worked for a multinational manufacturer who implemented ERP. And you can guess which ERP we implemented. Uh, and after four years of using it, I now work for the ERP vendor. Kind of a natural progression. Um, so I did the exact same thing I did at every other time. But thankfully this time, I'm kind of going right to the end. Thank you. So I managed to 50 minutes this time instead of an hour and a half. You guys have any further questions or do you want to know anything else about Postgres? I'm not a, a wizard necessarily in the whole history and knowledge of the software, but I live in it basically every day. So if you have easy questions, feel free to fire them off. Um, no. Yeah, not in the announce either myself. No, and nine six. And we did nine six. Uh Nine six three is what Arch. So I don't know. They're typically. Yeah. Um, uh, yeah. Actually, I built the Arch packages for the beta. Yeah, but I when I was coming here for the for the show, I was like, I better be running stable software. So I switched the actual database back into stable. Yeah, but I'm. Yeah, I I do within the company because I do DBA work inside the company. And I know um, typically with something like an ERP software, it has to be stable and not broken. I don't know if you know this, but web enterprises, when they come in, their software doesn't work, they tend to get really upset. Uh, so I am ahead uh, one version from our development platform. Because if somebody in the company doesn't do this, we're going to get blindsided when it comes out. So some of us do. Between 9 and 10, yeah. Yeah, then there was, there was, you know, we're, all of our information, all of our logic is all in PostgreSQL functions. Um, and we do this explicitly because we don't want to have to worry about what the client is. We're on Qt right now, uh, but there was a time where Qt may have died and gone away. So we started to panic and tried doing some JavaScript framework stuff and said, hmm, oh, Qt is back in force because it was picked back up again. Uh, and we kind of are back dedicated to this, but you need to be able to connect from anything and putting all your logic in the database. Um, <laughs> So this is one of those views that's kind of not easiest to see in the database side here. But let's go up. Yeah, functions. 1,494 database functions. We do almost everything within database functions. We use plenty of composite types. Uh, I think um, we also use PLV8. I don't know if you're familiar with PLV8, but Google's V8 engine, there is a PostgreSQL extension which will allow you to write database functions in V8 JavaScript. So you can actually manipulate everything in a database server using V8. Now it's V8 safe, so they neutered things like the web calls, the HTTP calls, and that kind of stuff. So you don't necessarily want people to go and just direct from your database server and make calls. Uh, but they neutered that kind of stuff. But yeah, everything within our application is is heavy Postgres. No, primarily the PLG SQL. Um, with the addition of PLV8 in here, we actually started to isolate some of that stuff into their own schema, just to kind of keep some of it Um, it was a way to keep our front end and back end on the same language and sharing some of the same modules. Um, we don't use it, you know, PLPG SQL is the primary. If we're making a function default, we're going there unless there's some reason that we want to do PLV8. Now we make uh, an e-commerce product on top of our own stack, which uses a lot of PHP and, of course, JSON. And pushing data back and forth between PLV8 and JSON between JavaScript is, here's your object, have fun. And it's nice when you can just accept that object in the function. Now you can with the PostgreSQL column JSON, of course, these days. But now you have V8's parsing abilities and everything else to go with it. Um, and and they look, you know, they look very similar. But the thing is, is that you're you're not making direct database calls in here. You're calling something like you know plv8.execute. Um, that looks like a plpg SQL function. I'm just trying to find one in here. Yeah, there you go. Here's plv8. 
So they're defined a lot like the PLPG SQL functions, but within the body of itself is PLP8 JavaScript. Um, and we have to, we actually maintain our own um, compiled binaries for PLV8 because we support Postgres 9.3 up to 9.6 and we need to be able to provide for Windows, Mac, and Linux, the three binaries that we provide, we need to be able to provide PLV8 for them as well, which means that we had to modify their build to the static build. For the actual code itself? Uh, GitHub. Yeah, everything, um, so everything we do is on GitHub. Uh, so there's a one main organization, of course. Let's see if I can get to it easily without making a dummy of myself. Yeah, it, it, it can be, but we, we keep everything uh, within Git, of course. So here's our main. Uh, the database itself has one revision, one version. So right now we're at 4.11.0 beta. Uh, and we uh, So we provide our own updater mechanism. And that's part partly what we were looking at here um, when we were browsing some of these functions. Things like add column stuff. Because we needed some way to provide item potent ways to say, I'm executing this cumulative update from version 4 to version 5. Here's all the columns that I added. I don't want to check if they're on your database server or not. So we create an item potent way to go and do this. Now, there's pretty much for all of these, we do this. Now, we ourselves, like I said, we created an updater application, which is basically it's just XML and a tar. That's all it is. You define the XML as, here's the files I'm about to import, and it will go in and update all of this to the recent version in that package. And those packages are versioned. Oh yeah, so they're they're either SQL or um, like for our development environment within our application, um, we're heavy on Qt script. So within our application, we actually embed um, a lot of the Qt development tools and a lot of things like uh, Qt script directly in the application. So those are text files that get inserted as a column in a row. So all of the scripts are just saved in there. Uh, we have an abstracted uh, SQL language that we call Meta SQL. How oh, handy! Um, and this allows us to do things like provide parameterized SQL queries. Um, SQL being declarative, declarative in nature, there are some things where we want to be able to provide options. So we have a separate engine which will read this and fill in the tokens. You know, if we have a token called the count type, we're going to include this in the generated statement. So it's a way to dynamically generate SQL statements. So we load these in again, and all these are just columns in a database. And pretty much, I guess I can show you on disk. Oh, let me hop into one that's unused. I can show you on disk. What some of that structure looks like. Oh, right, I killed Boffin earlier. It does not like being killed. I don't know if I'm familiar with the base. Yeah, we, we, uh, one of our uh, employees wrote a utility. It's called WTF Did You Do? And it'll allow you to take a base database and compare another one and to see what people did. Because, because we have so much extensibility in the app, when people go to upgrade, they may have destroyed themselves that so we need to now go fix. So that provides us an ability to do this. But that's not something we use. We don't, nobody knows that we have. We use it when they say what's wrong and then we can go tell them what they did wrong. Um, yeah, it's just an example. This is the package. Time tracks is the one I showed earlier. It's really a folder full of files. We separate them. The actual organization doesn't matter itself. It's just a folder that we logically organize. Here's JavaScript. Um, we'll stick. Uh, that's within Qt script. So we load those files in the database, and then we have a script parser within the Qt app, which will read those files from the database and execute them using Qt script. Um, if we're going to end up keeping Qt script alive. It's been deprecated since 5.7. They're still including it in the most recent versions, but we're so heavy on it that we may keep it alive if they decide to kill it. Um, but yeah, so basically things like the table definitions, these are just create table statements uh, which you can import into. But the, the base of this is the package definition. And this itself, uh, just blind here. Just XML. We're defining what the package is, the name of it. Uh, if there's any prerequisite checks, we want to make sure we're on a certain version. 
you want to make sure people can uh, confirm a license or something. And then here's the statements. You know, we're loading in a UI file from Qt. We're loading in uh, scripts. Or we're going to be executing a table. We want to input the table. This is the way that we uh, kind of keep our database consistent. Up to about two years ago, they were iterative updates. So you went from 4.0 to 4.1 to 4.2. Uh, as of version 4.4, everything is cumulative. You go from wherever you are to where we are with one update file. And a lot of that was changed because of the structure in here. Again, not necessarily foreign data wrapper related, but Postgres related. But th this kind of, uh, ma maintaining a Postgres database once you have it up can always be the tricky side. I mean, there's, there's people there who, who make sure, and you, you do run into issues. Even we build, when we distribute databases, we build them from source. You want to be able to have a recreatable way to say, here's my source files. I'm going to wind up with the schema in a proper database. But we, of course, have all of our internal tools to do this. So you can co-opt the, I mean, literally that's just an XML definition. The thing is, it's calling a bunch of functions that exist within our stock database, so you may have to have fun with that. But a lot of them are just those idempotent functions that create objects in the database that add columns to tables that may not exist. Um, so our, our repos are split. Of course, slash xtuple is the main company organization. Qt client is the full client, and xtuple is the database backend. So if you're going to go in there and start having fun, everything's open source. The GUI client is QClient, and then the other one was slash xtuple, xtuple, which is all the database source. Um, I use decisions that we've made in structure of the software all over the place when I'm doing projects that aren't related to the company. We've already put in all the effort to figure out how to do all this stuff properly. Things like QScript exposure, or um, we have a package which uh, Ben Thompson, uh, one of my coworkers, QScript is ECMAScript 4, uh, also known as Ancient. And a lot of the newer JavaScripts provide uh, things for you that are quite a bit better. Uh, so we actually, he actually, I should say, because he did almost all of the work, created a shim. You load this within the QScript environment, and it gives you all the polyfills for things like the Node.js buffer and all the other fun stuff it does. So this is uh, another open source thing that you can just go and take. Um, I point people to our own code base all the time. You want an example on how to do something? Go ahead. Um, yeah, because of this. Uh, so I don't know if you guys have any further questions on foreign data wrappers themselves. I thank you for your time. Um, I hope I've given you some sort of idea of how easy it is to take stuff that's not in Postgres and put it in Postgres. Uh, the only thing that I have to say about this is if it's some sort of transient remote source, like an RSS feed, uh, as we can see on some of these, I guess I cleared it already, it only returned 10 rows. So if he has a new post, one of those rows is going to disappear and you're never going to see it again. So it's going to be your decision to either use that as your source to archive locally or to view from that live source all the time as you're going through architecture. Now, one thing to keep in mind, um, I don't know if this has changed in a recent version, but anybody who had super user access to the database server can access the stored usernames and passwords from those user mappings. Um, I'm assuming that's going to be changed at some point. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, it is it is a limited risk because you do need to be a super user, but if you're trying to hide something from a remote accounting software, it will help. So that's, that's really the only gotcha that I have at the moment with any of this, and it hasn't actually been a gotcha in practice. It's just something to keep an eye out for. Um, otherwise, you're giving yourself a connection from one to another. It's as simple as that. Thank you very much. <laughs>